Hello and welcome to another geometry lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler and today we'll be doing Unit 5, Lesson 11 on Sequences of Rigid Motions. So this is our final lesson in our coordinate geometry unit. And today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at sequences of rigid motions. In other words, putting more than one rigid motion together to see where a geometric figure gets mapped or more challenging, to have two geometric figures and try to figure out a sequence of rigid motions that would map one of those figures on top of the other one. So let's get into it. All right, sequences of rigid motions. Now that we've worked with the three rigid motions both in and out of the coordinate plane, we can map figures using more than one rigid motion, a sequence or series of rigid motions. First, we need to review an important property though of translations. So we didn't spend specifically a day in this unit on translations because they tend to be kind of the easiest of all the rigid motions in the coordinate plane. All right, but there is one important property of rigid motions that, or of translations specifically, that we want to take a look at before we move on. Let's do that in exercise number one. In the diagram shown, segment AB has been drawn with endpoints at A, negative 4, 2, and B, 4, 8. Letter A. Draw the image of segment AB after a translation that maps each point along segment AB by 3 units to the right and 5 units down. Label the image segment A prime, B prime, show the mapping below. All right, this is pretty simple. I'd like you to pause the video right now and graph the image of AB, segment AB, after this translation. And again, all we're doing is sort of shifting the entire segment so that it moves three units to the right and five units down. Pause the video now and go ahead and do that. All right, well, let's do it with letter A, All right, with point A, right? We go three units to the right and one, two, three, four, five units down, right? And we will be right here at A prime. So what do we have? We want to show that mapping. A, which is at negative four comma two, is going to go to A prime, which is at negative one, negative three. All right, and that tracks, great. Now for letter B or for point B, right, we're at four comma eight. We want to move three units to the right and five units down. One, two, three, four, five. All right, and that's going to be B prime. And of course, what we're going to do is just connect the two to have segment A prime B prime. But let's get that mapping down, right? We have B at four comma eight. And we'll end up with B prime at 7 comma 3. All right, so nothing really new or fancy there. But now let's review or let's take a look at a very important property of all translations in the coordinate plane. All right, let's take a look at B. Calculate the slope of segment AB and segment A prime B prime. All right, great. Well, I'd like you to pause the video right now and go ahead and calculate those two slopes. All right, let's do it. So I'm gonna just move these up so I can still see them. All right, the slope of segment AB is going to be y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Be a little bit careful there. Eight minus two is six, and four minus negative four is eight, and that's going to reduce to a slope of three-fourths. All right, for A prime, B prime, here our slope will be the change in x, three, or sorry, the change in y, three minus negative three, over the change in x, seven minus negative one, and three minus negative three is six, seven minus negative one is eight, and that also is a slope of three-fourths. All right, great. So now we can answer letter C. Besides being the same length, what is also true about segment AB and segment A prime B prime based on letter B? All right, well, why don't you go ahead and pause the video and tell me what's true about the segment and its image segment based on these two slopes. Well, they're parallel. Right? 
right? We can tell that because they have the same slope. And that is universally true of any line, segment, or ray that gets mapped by a translation. As long as you're not like mapping it like right along the direction of the line in the first place, then your image line segment or ray will always be parallel to your pre-image line segment or ray. And that is unique amongst all of the different types of rigid motions. The only other one that's similar to that is a point reflection, which also produces an image that is parallel to the original um, pre-image, but that's only for like 180 degree rotation about a point. For translations, you are always getting image segments which are parallel to their pre-image segment. All right, now let's jump to our main topic, which is sequences of rigid motions. When we apply a sequence of rigid motions to a geometric object, we have a final image that is congruent to the original image because each rigid motion preserves the shape and the size of the object, right? And it does that because all rigid motions, all three of them, right, uh, reflections, rotations, and translations, all three of those rigid motions don't change the distance between two points, and they also don't change angles that get mapped, all right? So let's take a look at exercise number two. In the image shown, triangle ABC is plotted with vertices at A, 3, 2, B, 8, 2, and C, 8, 6. Letter A. Plot the image of triangle ABC after a reflection across the y-axis. Label the image triangle A prime, B prime, C prime. Show the mapping below. Great. This should be a piece of cake. Why don't you pause the video right now and plot the image of ABC after a reflection across the y-axis. Really important that you get the right axis here. Pause the video and take a couple minutes. All right, well, I think I'm gonna actually do the mapping first, or I'm gonna show the mapping first, and then I'll plot triangle A prime, B prime, C prime. I know that when I reflect a point across the y-axis, what's gonna happen is the x-coordinates are all going to change sign, and the y-coordinates are gonna remain the same. So in other words, A, which is at three comma two, will suddenly get mapped to A prime at negative three comma two. B, which is at eight comma two, will get mapped to B prime at negative eight comma two. And C, which is at eight comma six, will get mapped to C prime, negative eight comma six. All right, so it's simple enough. We've got negative three two, there's my A prime. I've got negative eight comma two, there's my B prime, and I've got negative eight comma six, there's my C prime. All right, beautiful. <laughs> gorgeous, gorgeous. All right, let's take a look at letter B. What is true about the orientation of the vertices of triangle ABC versus triangle A prime, B prime, C prime? All right, now this is rather important and we've talked about it before, but I want you to look at sort of, if you were to go around the triangle or its image triangle, right, alphabetically. So you go from letter A to letter B, from letter B to letter C, from letter C to letter A, et cetera, right? Think about clockwise versus counterclockwise going around that triangle. Pause the video now and think about this question a little bit. All right, so what I'm getting at here, let me just change colors so maybe we can see this a little bit better, right, is if I went from A to B, and I meant to make that red and it just didn't happen. Um, try it one more time, there we go. Okay, if I went from A to B, B to C, and C back to A, right, then I would be going around that triangle in a counterclockwise manner, all right? On the other hand, if I go from A prime to B prime, B prime to C prime, and then back to A prime, I'd be going around that triangle in a clockwise manner, okay? So in other words, what the reflection did was it changed the orientation. So um, triangle ABC goes counterclockwise, 
and triangle A prime, B prime, C prime goes clockwise. Now the reason that we want to point that out right now is that that will always happen whenever you do a line reflection. Whenever you do a line reflection, the orientation of the vertices will actually switch from clockwise to counterclockwise or from counterclockwise to clockwise as it did in this case. Now you might think, well that's kind of a interesting bit of trivia or you might think that's a bit of boring piece of trivia. Either way, it can be exceptionally helpful when you're trying to figure out whether or not a line reflection has occurred. If you see the vertices switch their orientation, then a line reflection has occurred. If they didn't change their, their orientation, then either a line reflection didn't occur or it two of them occurred, right? Because if you switch it once and then you reflect again, you'll switch it back, okay? Anyway, it's an important thing to know about line reflections. Now let's take a look at letter C. Plot the image of triangle A prime, B prime, C prime after a counterclockwise rotation about the origin by 90 degrees. Label its image triangle A double prime, B double prime, C double prime. Show the mapping below. All right, great. Well, again, we've certainly done counterclockwise rotations about the origin by 90 degrees. Remember, you want to just take your, your paper, you want to rotate it 90 degrees counterclockwise, read off the mapping, right? Read off the new coordinates for A double prime, B double prime, C double prime, rotate your paper back, and then plot that new triangle. Why don't you go ahead and do that now? All right, simple enough, let's do it. So I'm just gonna click on my graph paper. I'm going to rotate it 90 degrees counterclockwise. And now what I see is I see my A prime, which we'll go back and get the coordinates in just a second, gets mapped to A double prime, which is at negative two, negative three. And B prime, again, we'll go back and grab its coordinates in a moment gets mapped to B double prime, which is at negative two, negative eight. And finally, C prime will get mapped to C double prime at negative six, negative eight. There we go. And now I rotate my paper back 90 degrees clockwise, and now I'm gonna plot all right, let me just really quickly, A prime was at negative three comma two and it got mapped to negative two, negative three. So there's my A double prime. Uh, B prime was at negative eight two and got mapped to negative two, negative eight. So there's my B double prime and C prime, which was at negative eight six, maps to negative six, negative eight. And there's my C double prime. Now, by the way, notice, right, if I were to do that whole orientation thing again, right, if I went from A double prime to B double prime to C double prime back to A double prime, I would be moving clockwise just as I was on A prime, B prime, C prime. Rotations and translations will not alter the orientation of your vertices, which kind of makes sense. If I just took an object and I rotated it, right, like if I took a clock and I literally rotated a clock, it wouldn't change how the, the minute hands and second hand were going around that clock. They would still go clockwise, right? And likewise, right, if I took a clock and I just sort of shifted it here, there, or wherever, a translation, it also wouldn't change how the thing was. On the other hand, right, if I took a clock and I flipped it like this, all of a sudden and I could see through the back of it, now it would look like the hand, minute hand and the second hand were going counterclockwise. Okay, so let's keep doing work with sequences of rigid motions. Now, one of the most challenging things for students is determining a sequence. It's important to be able to determine a sequence of rigid motions that will map one figure onto another. Often, these sequences are not unique. In fact, I would go so far as to say that never are these sequences unique. And that might be the hardest part for students. Students love it when there's one and only one right answer to a particular math problem or any particular problem whatsoever. On the other hand, once there's multiple ones, it gets to be a little bit trickier. And it's even worse for a teacher because the teacher's got to grade it, right? They got to, they got to think about it like seven different ways to Sunday. Let's take a look at exercise number three. 
Parallelograms EFGH and MNOP shown below are congruent. Determine two sequences of rigid motions that could map triangle EFGH on, sorry, not triangle, that could map EFGH onto MNOP. Describe each in as much detail as possible. There are many, parentheses, actually an infinite number of correct sequences. All right. So, there are, there are an infinite number of right answers here, which means there's no way I'm going to cover them all. Now, one thing that's really important is I'm mapping EFGH onto MNOP. It is important that whatever I do, point E gets mapped onto point M. All right? That's critical. Point E has got to end up on point M. Point E can't end up on O or P or anything like that. Now, granted, there's no way it could end up on P or N because those are acute angles that would have to either end up on O or M to even get there. Anyway, so we got to make it happen, right? Now, one other thing, notice, right? If I look at EFGH, if I were to do that sort of like little mental thing that I did before in terms of the orientation, right? EFGH, that is a clockwise orientation, right? On the other hand, MNOP, that is a counterclockwise orientation, which means one way or another, our sequences have to include at least one line reflection. In order to get those vertices to switch, there's got to be a line reflection. That being said, let me just erase those so that we're not staring at them. They're a little bit messy up there. All right, so let's figure out one of the sequences together and then have you do another one on your own. All right. So one thing that I could do, right, especially if I really like reflections across the y and the x-axis, okay, is I could begin by taking this thing and actually maybe translating it up to here, all right? So maybe that's my first sequence, just translating my parallelogram up here. And by the way, I put a little red dot where E was because I want to kind of keep track of it. Now, why would I translate it up there? Well, I would translate it in that specific way so that I could then reflect it across the y-axis and it would then land with that vertice on M. Now, I wish I could do that really easily. Unfortunately, in my programming, it's not as easy to do that. But if I then reflected it across the x-axis, I could then have it sort of land on that particular thing. So, on that, on that particular parallelogram. So, let me just move it back for a second. All right. Now, where do I want it to be? Well, I want, right, I want this point, which is going to map to N, to be two units to the left because N is two units to the right. So, that's point F, right? So, what would I do to get point F to map that there? there? I would go two to the right. And 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10 units up, right? So the first thing I'm going to do for sequence 1 is I'm going to translate EFGH by 2 right and 10 up. Okay, great, right? Now, once I've done that, all I now have to do is take that parallelogram and reflect it across the y-axis. So then I'm going to reflect, and I'll call it E prime F prime G prime H prime across the y-axis. And then that'll do it. Right? It'll get it mapped onto MNOP. Okay, so that's one of an infinite number of answers. And there really are an infinite number of answers. So let's try to come up with another one. Okay, so why don't you go ahead and pause the video now and try to come up with another sequence. Well, and as again, I mentioned, there are an infinite number of them. All right, I'd love to be able to guess which one you just did, but it's not so easy, all right? So, what else could we do, right? Well, one thing that we could do at this point is we could actually start by doing the reflection across the y-axis, 
all right? Maybe we can just reverse what we just did, all right? So for instance, let me take this thing and let me flip it first, all right? And like literally, I know, not very satisfying, but if I reflected it across the y-axis, it would end up right there. Is that right? No, it's a little bit, yeah, 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 that's right, okay. Looked a little bit funny from where I was sitting over here. So I reflected across the y-axis and it's sitting right here, all right? Now, again, kind of key in on this point, I want this point to then map to point N, M. So what would I have to do? I'd have to move it two to the right, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, up. So this sequence would start with a reflection across the y-axis and follow that up by a translation of E prime, F prime, G prime, H prime by two units left and three units, oh, not three units, that's weird, and 10 units up. And that would also get the job done, right? So there are many different ways to do this. All right, these are just two of them. And the reason why there's so many ways of doing it, just to give you a sense for it, let's say just for a moment, obviously again, I can't do all of them, but let's say for a moment you sort of abandoned reflecting across the y-axis. Let's say you didn't want to reflect across the y-axis. So one thing that you could do is you could literally translate the parallelogram so that it looked like that, right? So you just translate it with whatever the translation rule would be to move it up there. And then you could reflect it across that vertical line, right? That line that basically goes right through point N, and then of course that point would map to point M, this point would map to O, and this point would map to P. And again, there's so many different examples of that. In fact, I could basically translate this thing just about anywhere I wanted to and then using the proper line of reflection, it would be a vertical line in this case, I could then get it to map onto that parallelogram. All right? And again, there's so many different ways of doing it. Makes it challenging. All right, I'm gonna go back to blue. And let's take a look at our next exercise, exercise number four. In the diagram shown, triangle EFG can be mapped onto triangle MNP by a sequence of transformations. If the first one is a clockwise rotation by 90 degrees about the origin, then describe what the second transformation must be. Describe it in as much detail as possible. Well, I like these a lot, right? When we tell you that there's two, and we give you one of them, and you've got to figure out the other one. So pause the video now, and see if you can figure out what the second transformation must be. Well, the best thing to do in this situation is to do the first transformation, right? So in other words, I've got these points. Let me lay them out here, right? I've got point E, which is at negative 4, 3. I've got point F, which is at negative 1, 3. And I've got point G, which is at negative 1, 9. The first thing that they say is that I'm going to do a clockwise rotation by 90 degrees about the origin. So if I did that, right, then what would happen is point E would get mapped to 3 comma 4. I'll call that E prime. Uh, F prime would get mapped to 3 comma 1. And G prime would get mapped to 9 comma 1. All right, so I'm going to just rotate this back and I'm going to plot the image. There we go. 3, 4. Uh, there's my E prime. Uh, 3, 1. There's my F prime. And 9, 1. That is my G prime. 
And now, I've got to somehow have that get mapped onto this. Well, it now should be fairly obvious that what I need is a line reflection. And again, it's kind of cool, because you could analyze that clockwise versus counterclockwise stuff. E prime, F prime, G prime, that's counterclockwise. M, N, P, that's clockwise. Now, what line exactly should I reflect it across? Well, if I connected, let's say, these two points with a line segment and these two points with a line segment, and I found their midpoints, which would be here and here, I could then connect those two midpoints to form that line of reflection, which is the horizontal line y equals negative 2. So remember, you can always draw a line of reflection by connecting and a pre-image point with its image point, find the midpoint, the line of reflection has to go through that. But of course, that's only one, right? And then maybe an image, a pre-image point and an image point, its midpoint. And once we have those two points, it's very, very easy to draw in our line of reflection. So, what is our second transformation? It is a line reflection across the horizontal line y equals negative 2. All right, that's as much detail as I can possibly give. Let's do one last problem. Exercise number five. Which sequence of transformations could be used to map triangle ABC onto triangle WXY? All right. Now, I think that this one's particularly tricky because the pre-image triangle and the image triangle are both isosceles triangles. So it's a little bit harder to get a sense for what's exactly going on here. Now, keep in mind, whatever the sequence is, it's got to map point A to point W. So what I always tell people in this situation is just stick with point A for a minute. You know, take point A and route it through the two transformations, the two rigid motions in choice one, and see, does it end up at point W? That doesn't necessarily mean it's the right answer, but I'll tell you this, if it doesn't end up at point W, it's definitely the wrong answer. Let's do that together for number one. So number one says a clockwise rotation by 90 degrees about the origin, followed by a reflection across the Y axis. All right. Well, first, we've got that clockwise rotation by 90 degrees. So first, where would A go in that case, right? A would end up being at 8 comma negative 2. All right, so I'm just going to, real quick, I'm going to say 8 negative 2. All right, and then it says a reflection across the y-axis. Well, if we reflected that across the y-axis, right, um, shoot, I said 8 comma negative 2, and that ended up being at uh, 9 comma negative 2. Let's change that a bit that would then map to here. Well, that's definitely not it, right? If I rotate this thing by 90 degrees clockwise and then I flip it across the y-axis, that didn't come anywhere near point W, all right? So that is definitely not the right answer. I didn't even hit anything on the triangle. All right, so what I'd like you to do is pause the video now and work through the rest of these, but just play around with point A, you know, and see where, where, which one of them gets point A to map to point W, and if you get multiple ones that work, then what you want to do is start playing around with points B and X, C, and Y. Pause the video now and go ahead and see if you can figure out what the right choice is. Well, the right choice, the right choice is always math, right? But in this case, what happens is that the right choice happens to be choice three. And let's take a look real quick, right? So again, following just point A, right? First, we're talking about a reflection across Y equals negative X, which would take my A, which is at two comma eight. Remember, a reflection across Y equals negative X is just going to take those coordinates and it's going to switch them and negate them. So that's going to be negative eight comma negative two, negative eight, negative two. Right, so this will be A prime. And then a translation by two units to the right and three units up would put it right there on W. 
right? Right there on W. And if I then took a look at where B went, it would map it right onto vertex X or point X, and C would map to point Y. All right, these are not unusual problems to have on multiple choice sections of either state exams or local exams, so you want to be able to make sure that you can work through them. All right, let's wrap this up. So the idea of sequences of rigid motions aren't new, right? We did this and extensive work on this in Unit 2, but it was almost always outside of the coordinate plane. Now we have more sophisticated tools in the coordinate plane, right? We can look at translations, rotations, line reflections, all right? And we want to be able to do two things with sequences of rigid motions. Number one, if we're given a point or a geometric object and we're given a sequence of rigid motions, we should be able to say what the coordinate points are of its final image. And the reverse of that, which is more difficult, if we're given two figures that are congruent in the coordinate plane, we need to be able to find a sequence of two or more rigid motions, it's often only two, that will map one figure onto the other figure. Therefore, by the way, proving that the two figures are congruent. All right, well, we will get more work with transformations and sequences of transformations as we move forward. For now, I just want to thank you for joining me for another geometry lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler, and until I see you again, keep thinking and keep solving problems.